Hey everybody, this is Pastor James. Welcome back to Pioneer Baptist Church for Bible study. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 34 tonight, and we are going to jump right in. We're going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we are going to walk through the chapter and try to learn how we can have faith in difficult circumstances. Let's pray. Father, there are many things that have come into the life of our church family, and even those who are listening online. There have been deaths, there have been sicknesses, there have been financial needs. But Father, you are the one who meets them all. You are the one who sees us through all of our trials and tribulations. And we want to tell you we're thankful for your consistency and for your love. And we want to ask God that you'd increase our faith. May it be like David's. May it be as this psalm represents tonight. Help us to become more like you. As we draw near to you tonight, Lord, hear our prayers, hear our hearts, and God, meet our needs, we ask because there is no other God who can meet our needs. There's nothing else that can satisfy us apart from you, the one true God. We give you all the praise tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Psalm chapter 34, it takes place at a place in David's life where he is not quite king yet, where King Saul is actually pursuing him because King Saul's just that kind of guy. He's always trying to kill David. So King David is running away, and he happens to go to the land of the Philistines. And you'll see right in chapter 34, under the uh, chapter, it says, A psalm of David, when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. King Abimelech was a Philistine king. He had heard that David, the mighty warrior, was in his country, and he wanted to see David face to face. So David acted like he was insane in front of King Abimelech. He drooled on his beard and he scratched on the walls. It's a pretty cool uh, story from the Old Testament if you want to go check it out at some point. However, it's in this context that he writes the following words. And it is in this kind of trial and tribulation, this struggle uh, that just doesn't seem to fit with God's people, right? This kind of a David is a man after God's own heart. David is doing what's right. David hadn't even sinned with Bathsheba at this point. Like he's just following the Lord. He's just a blessed man. And it just doesn't seem like this is where a blessed man should end up. And so as a Christian, as somebody who uh, is considered righteous in Christ, as a person who should be blessed in the Lord, it's difficult for us sometimes to view our sufferings in the correct light. So what we want to learn tonight is how David did this. And I have good news for you and I have bad news for you. The good news for you is it is simple. It is easy. It's one step. The bad news is that step is incredibly hard to wrap your mind around, if not impossible, to do it logically. So let's jump in. Verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. If you listen in verse four, it says this, I sought the Lord and he heard, or I'm sorry, I sought the Lord. He answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. And their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him, there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Brothers and sisters, he goes on um, and teaches us about what fearing the Lord looks like, what righteousness looks like. But we'll get a little bit more of the same throughout the rest of the chapter regarding God's uh, position as our deliverer. And how God hears us when we call to him. He rescues us. What a great message to be reminded of tonight. I want you to know something. King David was being hunted by King Saul. He was in an enemy's territory facing a enemy king. And his testimony is that God heard him 
that God heard him and delivered him from his troubles. Now, if you're anything like me, you may jump automatically to the conclusion that, well, God did deliver David out of the hand of Abimelech, and he also delivered David from the hand of King Saul. But he was still having to suffer. He was still having to suffer. So what good is a deliverance when you still have to suffer? What good is it? Well, I will have you know tonight that the key for David's outlook and his attitude is not pragmatism. In other words, he doesn't praise the Lord. He doesn't ask us to join in and praise the Lord because he doesn't have any trouble in his life. He asks us to come in and praise the Lord because David recognizes, he believes, he's placed his faith in the fact that all of his deliverance, all of his good comes from God. And here's the trick. The Bible teaches not only does all good come from God, but all your trials come from him as well. There's nothing that touches your life, one preacher said, that did not first come through the hands of God. That makes us pretty uh, uncomfortable with this God, right? Like, God, if you are God, why would you allow me to suffer? I understand that kind of reasoning. But the truth is, your reasoning does not in any way diminish God's sovereignty and rule over his creation. Whether you like it or not, he is in control and he has a plan. God in his mercy has revealed that plan to us through his word. And God has revealed himself and his character to us in that word. So when we look to him, we can know what kind of God he is. And we can know that he wants to care for us and that he has good plans for us. And that even though there are evil things in the world, he will overcome them. This is paramount. This is paramount in our understanding to realize that he is God and our faith should be in him alone. And our faith should cause us to realize that our deliverance comes from God alone. When we call to him, the Bible tells us, it gives us insight. He answers. He is moved on our behalf. We may not always see how that works, and we may even see what we would consider to be God's movement when we don't ask. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, God has given us insight into who he is, our questions about his sovereignty and how he chooses to rule does not negate his primacy in all of the creation order. It does not negate his absolute control over every aspect of creation. And so what we need to do is we need to come to grips like David has with the fact that God is in control, that God is the God who delivers, and that we can call on him and he will act on our behalf. So let's look at what this means as we observe the first few verses of this psalm. Psalm 134, or Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. Now listen, this is a decisive verdict. David has decided, I will bless the Lord. How often? How often will he bless the Lord? At all times, all times, whether good or bad, he will bless the Lord. In other words, he will say, God is great. God is awesome. God is good. No matter what the circumstance he finds himself in, he has made that decision. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, you have to make that decision too. If you're going to have any hope of seeing good in the midst of your trials, if you're going to have any hope of finding joy in the midst of uncomfortable circumstances. We just read about Saul or Paul and Silas as they were in jail and they were at 12 o'clock at night singing and praying to God when God heard them and delivered them. But they were singing and praising God in the middle of the night as they were in jail after they got beaten. And the reason they were able to do that is because they had decided that they would give God praise no matter what. Why? Because he's worthy. This is not a self-help gimmick. This is not about how to get through life easier with more secure footing. What this is, it's an act of faith in the God who created you. And you'll find out that when you build your house upon the rock 
of Jesus Christ, upon the rock and the foundation of faith in the creator God, your house will be very strong as you live it out. And so, yeah, as it happens, if you have the power of positive thinking, you can make your days better. But if you build your faith, not in your ability to think positively, but in God's nature, which is unchanging and eternal, your house will never shake. Because even on days when you're depressed and you can't conjure up good words, you will have already made the decision that God is with you, that God hears you, and that God will rescue you. It is God who we trust. It is God who we praise. And David came out of the gate saying, I will bless the Lord at all times. And I hope that that will be your conviction as well. Number two, he says, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. He's not just talking about the fact that uh, when things are good, he's going to have a, a joyous song um, in his heart. Like, uh, I think that one of the old choruses we used to sing growing up in church was, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will be joyous and be glad in it and be glad in it. You know, uh, that song is sang with some pep and it's supposed to be believable. But sometimes you come into church and you're not feeling really good and you just mouth the words, right? David had made a decision that he was going to have the blessings of God, the praise of God continually in his mouth. In other words, what part of the day, what part of the day would his God's praise not be in his mouth? Well, God's praise would be in his mouth all day long, not just part of the day and not just when the days are good. He said continually, the praise of God would be in the mouth of David continually. This is a decision he'd made. He made the decision that everywhere he went, everywhere he was uh, around people, and even in private, he was going to praise God. He was going to give him the glory he deserves. Like when I'm sitting on this porch and I'm recording this <laughs> sermon over a uh, cell phone and I'm going to post it to the internet where people can interact with it, I can praise God because he has allowed this technology. He's given me the ability to understand it, to post it. He's given you the ability to find it on the internet and he's given engineers glorious and glorious knowledge to be able to link it all together. God is good. God has given us so many good things and this is the kind of attitude and this is the kind of perspective that David has at all times. And just think about this, brothers and sisters, if you just take these two first things, if you take the fact that he will bless the Lord at all times, in other words, recognize God's greatness all the time. And then if he will praise him continually, in other words, your perspective and your shift is always towards giving God the glory and giving him praise for what he's done and what he's revealed around us. If your attitude is like that, what can happen on this earth that is going to shake you? When you walk into a situation and you know that God is good, when you walk into a situation and you see his hand of blessing and his wondrous uh, presence in everything that happens, it's going to be hard for your faith to be shaken. I've often wondered how David could have such a tumultuous youth, um, how he could walk through like getting taken away from his family into service, how he could see war and violence so early against against Goliath, how he could be betrayed by the king whom he serves so many times, and how he could be cast out from the nation he loves and forced into service to a pagan king and still not have lost hope. He always praises God. It's not just that he's an eternal optimist. It's not just that he thinks that he's strong enough to overcome it. He just knows that God is with him. And that's my prayer for you tonight, that you would know that God is with you. What does he say third? He says, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. I want you to understand something here. When David says his soul will boast in the Lord, that means from the deepest part of who he is, he is going to always give, uh, uh, how would I say it, deference to God in any situation. He was going to boast in the Lord. So when his servants come along and they say, David, man, you write these Psalms so well, he's going to say, it's only because of God's gifting to me. When they say, man, you are a giant killer. David is slain his 10 thousands. He's going to say, God is good. And he's f desiring to be glorified among his people. And so he's gifted me. He's going to always from the deepest part of his soul be making his boast in the Lord. 
we are so tempted, brothers and sisters, especially when it comes to need, to the need of being delivered, to boast in things other than the Lord. His praise is not always on our mouth. We don't always bless him. One of the favorite sayings that we have, and I've been guilty of using it from time to time, is that time heals all wounds. When we deal with grieving families like we have been in our church, we're tempted to say, give it time, give it time. The farther you get away from it, the more you'll learn to deal with it, and God will make you whole again. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, time has nothing to do with it. It's God's goodness. It's not time that heals, it's God that heals. It's not a doctor that saves you from cancer. It's God's goodness through that doctor. And I would hope that you would be able to have this perspective in the world. Because it's this confession, it's this seemingly uh, radical view of faith in God and seeing him in everything that the world often mocks. They're like, oh, well, no, that's just how things go. That's just, uh, you know, a coincidence or, you know, this is just a doctor practicing medicine. They downplay it. They say it's normal. They give praise to another. But you, brothers and sisters, if you want to have hope in trials and tribulations, if you want to be a great witness like David was, if you want to have epic faith, then the thing you have to do is you have to decide within your heart that all praise goes to God and that all recognition goes to God and that all responsibility and sovereignty is placed in God's hands. Why? Because it is all in his hands. It doesn't matter whether it touches us for good or whether it touches us for bad and suffering. God is still in control. And it's our confession of that, it's our understanding of that, that helps us get through these trials and tribulations. It's our understanding that God is in control that allows us to call out to him, to pray to him, to seek his face, to ask for his deliverance. When we don't believe that God hears us, when we don't believe that he delivers, when we don't believe that he's in control, then we do not depend upon him. No, we blindly float through life trusting in false gods and giving praise to false things. Brothers and sisters, this is an interesting, interesting psalm because it teaches us that faith is a decision that we make. Now, David has experiences. He has experiences that have taught him that God will deliver him. But the truth is, everyone comes to the time where they're going to meet their maker, where, you know, some people are going to get killed in battle. Not everyone's going to be delivered. The apostles were killed. Jesus was killed. Um, not everyone's going to be delivered or saved from every situation in life in the sense that, in the sense that your life will be prolonged. However, however, every time you make it through a valley, every time you make it through a trial and a struggle, it is God who has brought you through. In fact, if you just look over in verse 19, it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Now, what are the, what are the afflictions that are listed here in this psalm? Well, there are physical afflictions listed in verse 6 and in verse 10. And in fact, the entire setting of this psalm is a physical affliction of David fleeing for his life. There are emotional afflictions. If you look in verse 4, he says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. He is, a fear is an emotional response. It's not even a physical, actual state. Many of you have been in fear in your house because of COVID, and there's no actual COVID virus in your house, but you're living in fear nonetheless. God can deliver you from that fear if you will but trust in him, just like David trusted in God. So he was able to look Abimelech in the face and act like a crazy man and walk out of there with total confidence because he had faith in God in his deliverance. So not only do we have physical trials and tribulations, because verse 19 tells us that there are many different kinds of afflictions that the righteous do suffer. He says there's physical, there's emotional, but there's also spiritual afflictions. In verse 22, it says this, The Lord redeemed the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Listen to this. The Lord redeems, he buys back the soul of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. I want to tell you something. God delivers us from 
all afflictions if we will but put our trust in him. You may go to prison. You may suffer physical harm. Cancer may overtake you. You may have to endure a longer trial than your neighbors next door. But I want to tell you this, as long as you're alive, as long as there's breath in your body, it's because God is with you. So here's what we do. We don't just arbitrarily wait on a God who's so sovereign and in control that we just accept what he's given us. That's part of it. We have to accept that God's in control, but God has given us access to him to ask for deliverance. So if your back hurts from fibromyalgia, ask for deliverance. If you have chronic pain in your knees and in your hips, ask God for deliverance. If you have enemies that are trying to assault you and assail your character and say evil things about you, ask God for deliverance. And if you find yourself in a position where you're going to jail for your faith or where you're being accosted because of your belief, ask God for deliverance. I want to tell you something today. God's deliverance is going to come. And it may not come in the immediate situation you're in, but it's going to come spiritually when you stand before him. He is going to deliver you from all the pain and suffering and the afflictions that this world has to offer. And you will be made whole and you'll be with him forever. But just like you need to ask for deliverance from the physical things that you're experiencing, you need to ask for deliverance from your spiritual state as well. Now, David made a decision. He decided straight out of the gates, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I will, what does it say? Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth, and my soul will make its boast in the Lord. Listen to what it says at the end of verse 2. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Now, why can the humble hear it and rejoice? Well, because they are the ones who know that we're really not in control and that God alone can set the future and God alone can deliver. It's the proud people who still think that they can wiggle their way out of situations without going to God. It's the proud people who, by God's grace, have been successful in whatever degree they've been successful, but they don't realize that it all came through the hands of God. The Christian, the person of great faith, the person who calls other people to worship God realizes that God alone is in control and that God alone is our deliverer and that he hears us when we call to him. Now this whole, we're going to come back to this probably next week and explore a little bit more, but I just want you to notice the humble hear it and rejoice. And then he goes in and he starts calling other people to come in and praise God too. So what he gives is his own personal testimony about how great God is. And then he calls other people to join in on that praise. We're going to talk about that more next week. But I want you today, as we kind of jump into this psalm and we start exploring it, to consider what it means to have faith in suffering. I want you to consider what type of faith you have. Have you resolved to have praise for God on your lips all the time? Have you resolved to uh, make your boast in God alone in all, search, in all circumstances? Or do you give praise to other people? Do you give praise to yourself? Do you ignore God as long as things are going good? And do you ignore him or do you condemn him when things start going bad? I wonder if you've decided already to acknowledge God's position and his sovereignty and his priority in your life and that you give him praise all the time, all day long you sing his praise. If you don't do that today, then I wanna encourage you to do that. Some of you might not do that because you've never thought of it before, but some of you might not do that because you want God to prove himself first. Like, God, you must actually deliver me and then I will praise you for your deliverance. Brothers and sisters, if you're waiting on God to consistently deliver you, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, you can stop waiting. One day, you're going to face death and it's going to consume you unless he comes back and gets you first. So you are going to lose to your enemy. He is going to allow you to die and be overtaken by death. But I want you to be encouraged about this. He has overcome death and he is the deliverer from death. 
just like he's the deliverer from hunger and from financial problems and physical, um, a lack of physical health and having enemies coming against you, God is the deliverer for it all. I need you to believe that tonight. And I need you to make the decision to believe it and that you would give God supremacy in all things, not just in a part of your life, but let his praise be continually upon your lips. Let your soul continually give him praise because brothers and sisters, he alone is God. There is no other. He alone is the giver of life. There is no other. He alone is the sustainer of every fabric, every piece of our universe. There is no other. He alone deserves the praise. And so let us decide in our hearts that we will submit to these truths. We will submit our lives to God, and then we will rejoice in the knowledge of of his rule and his reign. And we will rejoice in the fact that he delivers us. We will rejoice in the fact that he hears us. And we will rejoice in the fact that he is a good, kind, patient, loving God who has focused his affection on you and on me. What a wonderful gift. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Father, for your word. Help us as we try to apply uh, David's words of encouragement to our souls. Let us grow in faith. Help us to decide to trust you, regardless of what the world taught us about uh, who's in control or what causes us to be delivered, regardless of our tendency to want to have proof before we place our faith in something. God, let us grow in our faith. Let us give you the glory that you so richly deserve. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great week. Come and see us on Sunday at 1030 at Pioneer Baptist Church. We are open. We are open to the community. Uh, if you want to wear masks, if you want to wear protective gear, please come in. We do definitely still sanitize after the services. If you want to social distance, make sure you talk to people about that. Um, but brothers and sisters, uh, it's time to come home. We would love to see your face. We'd love to worship with you in person. Until then, we are praying for you and we are praying for the church family all together. We are praying that God's kingdom would continue to grow in the midst of this unique and mysterious place we find ourselves in in 2020. Y'all have a great week. Talk to you soon.